to welcome everyone to the Hurley Investments Financial Services Commentary for Tuesday, September 4th. Hopefully you had a great holiday weekend, and let's make sure it's the 4th it is. Um, a couple questions came in, and I will answer all three of those. But I want to start off with, what can you tell me about the month of September in the stock market? Type a couple things in. Abraham from VectorVest. Abraham got this from VectorVest. From VectorVest on Friday, 8.31, got September Almanac. September is a month that mood changes. Vacation season has ended. It's time to put away things of summer, and it's time to face reality. Purchase Dr. Elmick describes September as the biggest percent loser on the Dow and the NASDAQ since 1950. Since 1998, the Vector has got up 11 times an average gain of 3.9% and down nine times an average of 5.97. The reason for September is relatively poor performance has varied over the years from psychological moods to anecdotal claims of money managers, cleaning house, learners, blah, 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 blah. Uh, analysts lowering forecasts after Labor Day, but rising earnings auger as well as for September Almanac. So that's interesting. Are there any other comments before I throw some things in here that you guys would like to say? Because with all due respect, um, I'm not agreeing with uh, VectorVest um, at all. None of those are quantifiable. So because it's not quantifiable, there's no way to justify and or prove that. <laughs> and Lance says, and I don't like VectorVest anyway. <laughs> All right, so let's go to something a little more pliable on why people say that it's the worst month for investing. And some of it comes close, but... Um, what it really comes down to is historical averages. But one theory that stands head and shoulders above anything is many, if not the majority of mutual funds, experience their fiscal year end in September. Mutual fund managers on average typically sell losing positions before the end of the year. They replace them with winners that they've had throughout the year. And because of that, you see a, a typical selling the end of September and then a, another cycle that will start the first couple weeks of October where they'll sell out of some other losers to lock in those losses in a new year and work on to, to the next year from that side forward, having a little bit of a loss to make up. They do make the comment, once fall begins, investors typically work in, in exit positions and plan on selling anyway. I think that's kind of a load of crap. That's a theory. It's, it's kind of funny. One particular theory points to the fact that the summer months usually offer light trading volumes in the stock market, as a good deal of investors typically take vacation time and refrain from selling stocks from their portfolio. Uh, it's funny because in all honesty, that is small money. Big investors, institutional investors uh, are always working on selling their positions. It's just... Uh, it's what a money manager that's in charge of a, a fund is. So even that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But what I want to get to is we have a problem in that September is not a good month for our stock market. So 
what do we do about it? What do we do about it when September's not a great month in our stock market? For whatever the reasons are, it doesn't have to be this reason, but for whatever the reasons are, what do we do about it? Lighten up positions, go to more cash. We could do that. Um, but what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Um, you beat on bear trends if you can get some kind of confirmation. That is true, Abraham. You can sell calls. It's kind of a hard decision. In all honesty, I'll be 100% honest with you. I am ridiculously worried about our stock market. Ridiculously worried. Poor Keeve, is Keeve here? Keeve's here. Poor Keeve has heard me tell him again, boy, what kind of a weird year of training, of trading that we're going through. It's weird. It's ridiculous. It just doesn't make a lick of sense. I want to blame it on Trump. I want to blame it on too much money coming in. The U.S. is the best stock market. I don't know what to blame it on. I'll be 100% honest with you. I don't know what to blame it on. What I do know, it's ridiculously hard. And I spend my time finding more and more uncertainty in our stock market. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this from Mark P. Mark P, that's an excellent comment there. Totally overextended. Um, could drop 20%, but still in a solid uptrend in a solid uptrend if I can go ahead a little bit even better the XPX or S&P 500 at all time high valuations and always has had an over 30% correction when touching Um, valuations above 25. We are, oh, 2008. So we are 5.5 years overdue for a 20% correction. And what's even a little interesting is an article that I read here recently, and I believe it's from Merrill Lynch, that I think is unbelievable. J.P. Morgan's. J.P. Morgan's top quant, quantitative guy, warns the next crisis to have flash crashes and social unrest not seen in 50 years. So this is Marco Kedlanovich. But the short answer is, he says, um, where is it? He wrote a 168-page mega report, but where is where is it? 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 If you had these liquid, okay, so there are very rapid, sharp declines in asset values and flash crashes. Those flash crashes occurred during backdrop of economic expansion, recession. It doesn't matter where it happens. Um, if you had these liquidity-driven dri sharp sell-offs, it comes at the end of the cycle or maybe the cause of the end of the cycle. But where is it? Where? Is it? Here we go. 
it's right here that I want you to pay a little bit of attention to because I'm going to tell you extremely important. The rise of automated trading strategies is a factor because many quant hedge funds or electronic trading would also fall in here are programmed to automatically sell into weakness, he said. Together, index and quant funds now make up as much as two-thirds of assets under management globally, and 90% of daily trading comes from these similar strategies, he wrote, which also means it's higher taxation because they're no longer going for Long-term taxes are going for short-term taxes. Basically, right now, you have large groups of investors who are purely mechanical. They sell on certain signals and not necessarily on fundamental developments, such as an increase in the VIX, and I believe that is Mark that just brought up the VIX there, or a change in the bond uh, equity correlation, or simple price action. I mean, if the market goes down 2%, then they need to sell. Lastly, electronic trading desks at banks and other firms tend, to, uh, firms tend to withdraw when markets get rough, remove liquidity, and contribute to cascading decline in prices. So you're looking at a liquidity pr uh, problem. And here's where this best explains the uh, the damage it'll do obviously in the stock market primarily if you're in calpers or the california teachers credit union that's not true the california teachers pension fund suddenly every pension okay if markets fall by 40 percent or more the federal reserve would need to leap into action no longer they might they have to do quantitative easing we are no longer into, we can let the markets run. We're now dependent on quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve would need to leap into action to prevent spiral that led to, to a depression. That could lead to unconventional actions, including direct purchases of equities above that Japan Central Bank has already taken. Suddenly, every, not all, not most, not some, every pension fund in the U.S. is severely underfunded Retail investors panic and sell while individuals stop spending. If you have this type of severe crisis, how do you break the vicious cycle? The negative feedback loop? Maybe you stimulate the economy by cutting taxes further, perhaps even negative territory. When you say cutting taxes, he more he, I'm sure he's thinking taxes, but he's probably talking about uh, um, interest rates. I think most likely is direct central bank intervention, asset prices, maybe bonds, maybe credit, maybe perhaps equities, if that's the eye of the storm. Uh, this is really an unbelievable read. And I like where he's going at with this because it explains, in my opinion, where we can go to. And the fact that if central banks head off the worst of the crisis, it's just putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, Armstrong kind of came in with the same thing. Basically saying, hey, the next crash is unbelievable. And we're already in the most hated bull market in history. But it, it's very interesting to see that maybe we're not in a bubble right now. But maybe we're looking at technology that doesn't think that'll be the selling off or the global drop that happens in our market. Um, pretty interesting read here uh, from Armstrong. I put it in there for you. But my, my short answer that I'm trying to come up with right now In the flash crash that happened, I don't know if it was 2008 or 2010 where it was 1,000 points pretty quickly, finished at only 400. Um, if we had that type of crash, 
for me, it's going to create the need to put on long puts no matter what the price is. There are times when I hold off on long puts. There are times when long puts are not worth the cost when VIX and extrinsic value and I want to say this when VIX and intrinsic value push the price of the long put into I'm just going to call it dumb oops wrong one wrong one again Um, Harley, what am I doing? What did I do? Into dumb pricing. And what I mean by dumb pricing, if you can put it on and the next day with the drop in volatility, you can lose half of its value, that is dumb pricing. That is pricing that is not what you should be using or looking at in the stock market. That is pricing that doesn't make sense even if, uh, even if there is a chance of a stock losing 25% of its value. You just don't spend money at that price for puts. The probabilities are not in your favor. I'm worried about our stock market. I'm worried about our next drop. And I'm at the point, the, actually let me put it this way. The reason why I worry is because what if we can't catch up? I had a hard time in 2008 or nine or whenever we had that thousand point, not the one that we happened this year, the 1600 point this year, I was covered. But the one before for new money that came in, I had a hard time having any protection put on. The question was just asked, and what kind of signal would push you to go ahead with buying protection no matter what cost. Um, the signal will happen so quickly, I won't catch it, Abraham. There's not a signal that's going to be available to us. It's going to be a cascading drop in our stock market. Well, Kevin, they have... Um, they have circuit breakers now. With all due respect, BS, we don't have circuit breakers now. At least not any that, in my opinion, would work. Well, Kevin, what are you talking about? Well... In February, we had this drop that's supposed to work at 5%, 71 down to below 68. So it should have been 350 points that triggered a 5% drop, and a circuit breaker. It might not have hit it there in on the NASDAQ, but it definitely hit it
it ridiculously hit it. And the spies. Five percent. wasn't triggered didn't happen some weird days so with all due respect it obviously doesn't happen on an index I don't remember the Dow Jones. So twenty five hundred. Twenty five hundred, a thousand two hundred and fifty. Eh, pretty close on that one. So where am I getting at with this? Um, all I'm trying to say is that um, you're going to need to be careful into the future. So what would you do? How would you fix this? Mark, uh, you just typed in there. Large daily ranges will help you help you with dumb pricing. Have to be nimble to trade in shorter term. I disagree 100. percent You're you're 100 wrong there. The shorter term will have even higher volatility with even more ridiculous pricing, where you can see option prices be three times as expensive as they were before, and lose two thirds of their value with uh, a 20 percent drop in the VIX. So shorter term increases the VIX and the volatility or the extrinsic value in the pricing. That is not a way to solve it. So one of the ways to solve it actually is run with more long puts in place. Rich, that could be hard because in all honesty, that could eat up 16 to 32% of your profits to have them. Oh, run with more long puts. So, so if you're always protected, it could eat up 16 to 32% of your total profits for the year, which means if your stock doesn't make 16%, you lose money. Um, you could run a couple extra long puts in place, but what I've come up with would be to, to extend my time. Instead of buying my puts a uh, week and a half to two and a half weeks before earnings, I'm going to go to three and a half weeks. You could. Um, farther out in time, the money puts or time, that's a great idea, Mark. That would be perfect. You could do some out of the money for cheaper farther out in time to maybe protect you for a black swan event, which is what we think it could be. So actually, Mark, that is that is what I was trying to formulate, and I couldn't say it. But that is right on right on task there. Um, <sighs> earnings doesn't even start for crying out loud till the middle of October, if you go by Alcoa. Let me see when Alcoa is there. Pretty sure it's like the seventeenth. A A Alcoa earnings. Uh, estimated the 17th of, of October. So I may have to protect myself in through September for some positions. What are some positions? And something, if you ask me what I did today, go ahead and figure this one out. Buy deal. Anyone knows what happens tomorrow? That's great English, huh? Anyone knows what happens tomorrow? <laughs> Do 
There you go. 9-5. The end of the public period of tariffs. And Trump is more than willing to slap a new, another $200 billion in tariffs on China. So if you ask me what I did today by way of trading, since I'm in Baidu, added long puts or bear puts out to October monthly for buy deal. Uh, looking at a day like today, if you're to ask me how I'm looking to trade, added a small number of Facebook contracts at uh, at the June 220 200 strike. Some for some new money, some for some old money, some that I need to have a conversation with uh, someone after the fact to uh, make sure they understand where I'm looking at going with it. Added forward, January 2020, long calls. $10 strike for a dollar. Um, what was the other one I was looking at last week? Um, on Apple for a few new client money. But a small amount to dollar cost average into a drop in September and October of 2018. I'm just testing the waters. Uh, on Apple, which ones did I do on Apple? Pretty sure I did. Let me take a quick check. Let me take a quick check. On Apple, I did 240s. And they're also January. Ooh, or maybe they're June. No, I think they're January 220. At uh, 240 strike. I'm going out in time. Uh, my protection in these positions is that there's a lot of time for them to be into play. Uh, I'm not looking at, at collar trading them per se. I'd be looking at doing more dollar cost averaging because I could also see a run even with all the things we have coming up here in November, I could see a run after the elections that's another 10% higher in the S&P 500 from where it is right now. So Abraham makes a quick comment. If you're so much concerned, it would be a simpler path to simply close positions, go to the beach till you're again comfortable to go further. No, because there are many times where the markets are uncomfortable. But my job isn't to be comfortable in the market, Abraham. My job is to make money under any market condition. Doesn't mean I'm profitable, but if I make any money to the downside, that's less than it has to come back to the upside to be profitable. 
I call or trade. So something like this will allow me, if I can catch some portion of the wave to the downside, will allow me to pick up more shares. Uh, for a couple of people who've sat with me on American Outdoor Brands Corp, we're basically at a break even on it right now. Yes, it might show the cost basis is closer to $18, but when you add all the protection to the downside and what have you, we're very close, if not there today with today's movement, to a break even on American Outdoor Brands Corp. And we have at least three to 700 shares that have been added over the last year and a half to two years. Same thing with Under Armour. If you've been with me in Under Armour for two years, we've got 700 to 1,000 shares doubled up on our shares on Under Armour. There are opportunities to be there. Now, Abraham, if, if I was an individual investor, I wouldn't feel bad about taking my money and taking it out of the market for a while. But I'm not an individual. Uh, I'm a registered investment advisor. I'm licensed, bonded, insured. And instead of running from the challenge, running away from it, I have to run to it. So part of the ways to do it, Mark made a great comment, out of the money. I can obviously add more long puts as it breaks support levels, like, uh, like Rich made the comment. But I'm also starting to protect just a little bit longer. I'm going to do a little bit of protection before the earnings event and make sure I get out at least a month, if not a little bit farther, just for, for this earnings. Not to mention, I might just have to protect for September. I'm really trying to protect, if you ask me, from today or from next week out to the end of November. That would be my ideal time to protect so I can get through a Chinese gold-backed uh, currency to trade oil so I could uh, so I could get through the midterm elections. There are just some things that I'm looking to take extra time with to be able to make some money coming up here. Um, uh, a question was asked earlier, Kevin, on any of these, would you consider a poor man's caller? If I went in the money, that's exactly what I did. If I was to do a deep in the money, I would do a poor man's caller. I would start to protect it right now uh, up into the earnings event. And then I would obviously restructure it for the earnings event on any of these ones, whether it's Apple, Facebook. Um, Ford, or even Baidu's awfully close, or Visa, I'm sorry, Visa could be another one, not Visa, which is, I've got one from last week, I don't remember what it was, but there's a fourth one that I'd also look at going straight long calls for leaps, but that I would want to have the opportunity to dollar cost average them down the road. All righty, let me get to some basics here. If you ask me what's happening this week and why, plain and simple, ISM index came in at 61.3 versus an estimated 57.6. More importantly, Construction spending was awful, coming in at 0 0.1 versus an estimated 0 0.5. But um, if you ask me what's going on on this week, really it's going to be a pretty boring week unless tariffs, come on, Hurley, type correctly. Tariffs of 200 billion are levied against China. Canada trade agreement 
starts tomorrow. So where does all this equal? All of this equals... Massive headline risk. A lot of who knows what's going to happen is coming down our pipeline for the next couple months. Now, what can contra what what am I trying to say here? Um, what could save us? What could save us from all this headline risk and this worry? What saves us? Think, 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 think. I'm not going to give this one to you until I see a couple answers come in. What saves us? Insurance on the right size. That was actually not one that I was thinking of. But buying line, uh, long puts, right size, or hedging positions, that is not what I was thinking. I was thinking of an, an outside, but that is 100%. Protection through the event. I'll give you guys both that. That was not one that I was thinking, but keep going. Give me another one. There you go. I'll give Keeve credit for this one. He works for me, but very good answer. Keeve made the comment. Stocks. Still are buying trillions of dollars of shares back. So you do have stocks that put a long put into place. We could also see a Fed not raise rates. That would be a big one to keep the easy money going. You could see a, a dollar lose value would also keep the, the bull run running. Uh, we could have a government shutdown. That's another worry. We could have uh, Democrats win the... Uh, the, the race is coming up here. We could have an impeachment. I mean, there's a lot of what ifs out there. But the strong dollar kills us. Every time our dollar goes strong, it kills us because we're in a global market. Not raising rates allows the easy money flow to continue. Pretty amazing. Um, there's still trillions of dollars. In fact, if I can just make one other comment that I thought was interesting, Apple versus Amazon, right? Apple made $168 billion versus $200 billion in revenue from Amazon. So pretty pretty amazing, right? That uh, Amazon over I think it was the last two years Amazon has made more revenue than Apple.
but Apple profit was like 130 billion and Amazon profit was any idea? Any idea how much Amazon made off of their 200 billion over the last two years of revenue? You can maybe say 12, but if you take the negative ones out, it's like six. And a couple of comments just came in. Apple is a one product company. So is Amazon. It just sells crap. But with all due respect, Apple's into services now. Apple's into iCloud now. Amazon still makes its bulk of its money from selling stuff and the minuscule profit margin it still is buying up properties and distribution centers and still has 30 40 50 years of debt there's no real diversification for Amazon they still buy other businesses that fail left and right Apple has computers, Apple has music, Apple has um, apps, still major revenue comes from its iPhone, but boy, the services in the iCloud, huge. Good to see it moving that direction. All right, so here we go. We're bullish. Glad I'm still spelling so well. Bullish on the Dow. We are still bullish on the spies, but we're coming off of an oversold. And we are technically just coming off, but that could be a change. We are overbought. I said oversold. I meant overbought. Overbought bullish on the NASDAQ. We're just coming off the overbought on the S&P. And we didn't quite hit it, but we were pretty close on the Dow. Uh, I still think September could be a 2% down month. For earnings, uh, OCGO, which is Broadcom, big earnings on Thursday. Marvel is one that I trade on Thursday for earnings. DocuSign, C-Trip on Wednesday. Shield, I'm not sure if they report Tuesday or not. I thought they were last week, but they came up again. Uh, average work week on Friday, big numbers there. Thursday for ADP will be rather important. I'm not sure why it was on Thursday. Actually, I know it's because of the holiday on Monday. Usually ADP is on Wednesday, but notice ADP is coming on Thursday, a day later. Tomorrow, auto truck sales could move forward back up to 10. Nothing internationally that stands out right now. I think we are the, the people. <laughs> um, interesting Armstrong article that I cut and paste in here for you. Do read in its entirety. The JP Morgan's top quant warns next crisis have flash crashes and social unrest not seen in 50 years. It's a liquidity crisis. Please read through this one in its entirety. Pretty interesting. Welch versus Bezos. Um, it's General Electrics, and it's really where it shows how Amazon could become the next General Electrics, all because of revenues and money. I also found it interesting. If you go and you do Apple versus uh, Amazon earnings at CNBC, you'll find some very interesting information. I also have where the Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh stands on key issues. He was up on the Hill today getting grilled. Uh, I thought this was important. Um, I didn't check all of them, but I checked enough to believe that each one of these would be correct. And then a little bit on how much American money have saved and what that really means in real numbers. 
this has been thrown a couple different ways, but it's pretty interesting to see where people are are not necessarily saving, even though we have the U.S. at, at much higher median levels of saving than ever before. With that said, let me get to questions. And our first question is, Um, a comment was being made that Amazon is taking sales from other retailers, slowly pulling out of businesses and making competition and reducing competition. Kind of, but I mean, obviously they are, but it was kind of nice to see that uh, Best Buy kind of beat that in their last earnings, their last couple earnings, beat that narrative saying, you know what, there's still plenty of people that want to touch and feel it and with some of the price matching, they can now compete in keeping people in the store, not necessarily making the money on the product, but on the value-added services. Hey, we'll sell you a two-year warranty on it where our geek squad goes and it does all the the uh, fixing of the computer and stuff like that. So it's kind of neat to see how some stores are doing the value-added services that uh, – that actually keep those purchases within their store and those value added services are, are making money. What questions do you have? If there are any questions, I do have a phone call in 12 minutes, but co-marketing deals with cell phones cares at Best Buy too. Uh, Mark, I didn't realize that, but I would agree a hundred percent. There are some co-marketing deals where they get a piece of the piece of the cell phone now as well. Any other questions or comments? So with Ford not concerned with the bond downgrade, uh, I'm not yet. Um, their bonds are already in place. There's not a reason for them uh, to need a huge amount of cash in the near future. So the bond downgrade on Ford is not something that I'm worried about yet. I have not worked the numbers out for it, though. So I may change my tune next week. But, uh, but yeah, four could go to $6. It could go down to $3.50 where it bounced on 2008. But uh, I still think Ford has done and is doing everything right. All right, guys. Hey, I appreciate you having me here tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, I will make sure this gets posted here quickly. Last week's was just posted, I believe, today. So I had a talk. Dave and I are both gone, just bad timing. I'm sorry last week's was not posted sooner, but last week's is on the website right now. There is a link to it, and I will get this posted most likely tomorrow so that if you want to take a peek at this again, uh, get that information, you will have it. I appreciate you being here. I've got a call at 7 o'clock, which gives me about 10 minutes. I'll make that call. You guys have a wonderful evening, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.